Hey guys, welcome to part two. I'm Dr. Elliot with 1HP, and today we are going to be talking about how to optimize your aim training with science. As Matt mentioned, we both spent an extensive amount of time digging through the literature in both neuroscience and motor learning to truly understand the scientific basis on how we want to optimize our aim training. So today, you guys will be learning about how we learn as humans and the best way to optimize your aim training schedule in regards to how long and how many times per week to get the best results for your time. A lot of discussion has been had in the esports community about the legitimacy of aim training. In this section, we aim to clarify what aim is and if it can indeed be improved and how. Aiming in a virtual environment is a neuromotor skill. Like anything else, you have to train your body and brain to do well, such as jumping, biking, or driving. Our brains learn motor skills in similar ways, no matter the specifics of the skill. Motor learning can be defined as the acquisition of new patterns of muscle activation in time and space to improve performance of a motor task. So whether you're a beginner learning to aim well, or a pro trying to get 0.01% better, today the principles derived from science are unchanged. So the next question we have to ask is how do humans learn new skills? The roadmap to being highly proficient at a skill is a process of moving through three different phases. These phases were described in the scientific literature by two guys named Fitz and Posner. These phases can be broken down into the cognitive phase, which we're going to call the noob phase, the associated phase, which we will call the amateur phase, and the autonomous phase, which we can think of as the pro phase. These phases are not fixed, and as you modify and adapt new techniques or change variables like your DPI, sensitivity, keybinds, etc., you move back and forth through them. All right, first let's talk about the noob phase, aka the cognitive phase. In this phase, the big question is what to do. In the cognitive phase, you are still developing an understanding of the game mechanics, so this is your complete noob who is just learning the mechanics of the game. Seasoned players will also spend some short amount of time here whenever they make big changes to their keybinds, DPI, etc. The amount of time that you spend here is directly related to how much previous experience you have with other similar skills. So coming from a MOBA to an FPS game will keep you in this phase longer than somebody coming from another FPS with slightly different aim mechanics. This phase is all about understanding the demands of the game, the physics, how well you are able to interact with the mechanics, and what your baseline skill set coming in feels like. All right, let's talk a little bit more about the noob phase here. In this phase, you are trying to build what we call a cognitive map of the task. You're going to do this by assessing your own abilities and seeing how you're performing in this new environment. In this phase, you're trying to understand what the task demands of you exactly, and you're identifying what the individual stimuli are that are associated with the task. Things like inputs, those are our peripherals, mouse and keyboard or controller, and the feedback that we get from the game. Things like game physics, uh, bullet drop mechanics, stuff like this is all going to be uh, formative when we're developing this kind of cognitive map. Um, you're also contacting memory of other similar experiences for context cues. Things like other games with similar mechanics. We talked a little bit earlier about other FPS games. If you're switching to another FPS game, you're going to have a leg up when it comes to learning the mechanics of that game. Or your previous settings if you're a pro just making changes. You're learning to select the appropriate response in a given scenario, and this is where game sense starts to develop. You're going to be performing initial approximations of the task to understand the parameters that you have to work with. And this is where things like training modes or target dummies you'll see new players flock to to try to really understand exactly what it is that they're doing in this new environment. During this process, you're going to be building a structure for your motor program. So this is where bad habits that are initially formed become very difficult to break. And you're going to be modifying all of these initial responses based on your successes and failures. So if you have a coach or a third party observer that can kind of point out where you're missing things early on, it's going to be a lot easier to not develop bad habits and break them early. Give you a real leg up. So instead of developing these compensations for poor mechanics, focus and train on mechanics that need work if you do have a third party observer. Up next, we have the amateur phase, also known as the associative phase. And the big question we're answering here is how to do. So in the associated phase, you understand the aim mechanics of the game, and you are experimenting with the variables associated with them. 
This is your amateur player who has a solid understanding of what the game mechanics are and is learning how to apply them in a way that makes sense. They still don't have a solid sense of timing, they improperly sequence actions, and still kind of have a low sense of control over aim skills that require precision and are experimenting with new strategies to perform aim skill tasks. This is the best stage to use to figure out where your skills are deficient using aim assessment tools. Let's talk a little bit more about the amateur phase. In this phase, you're going to be really practicing your movements while refining your motor program. And by this, we mean you'll be developing your spatial, which is 3D space, and temporal, which is timing organization. You're going to be decreasing your errors and decreasing unnecessary movements. You're also decreasing dependence on things like visual feedback cues, which means you're going to be watching the reticle less and knowing instinctively where it is on your screen. You're going to be increasing your use of proprioception, which means you'll be knowing exactly where your hands or peripherals are in real world space without having to look at them. And you're going to be performing cognitive monitoring. Examples of cognitive monitoring include planning, checking, self-testing, and assessing your progress while correcting your errors. So this is where standardized skill assessments can be utilized to get a baseline idea of how your performance is and let you track your progress towards moving forward. All right, let's talk about the last phase, the pro phase, also known as the autonomous phase. And in this phase, the big question is how to succeed. In this phase, you have mastered the mechanical skills at the highest level and are looking to refine the application of them in the in-game environment. These are going to be your pro players that have become mechanically proficient. At this phase, most players are more concerned with consulting with third parties and utilizing tools such as VOD review to help improve their in-game decision making also known as their game sense, and give them a huge competitive advantage over their opponents. When all you do to train is grind custom matches, you're spending a huge amount of time practicing the most relevant aim skills that are most frequently used during a competitive game. This is why pro players are where they are and are ultimately successful. But when the tournament standings can come down to the difference between one missed shot, spending time training all possible components of aim in isolation will give you that competitive edge that can set you apart from the rest of the elite crowd. So let's dive a little bit deeper into what the science says about the pro phase. In this phase, you are mainly going to be practicing movements and continuing to refine your motor responses. Your spatial and temporal movements are going to be highly organized. Your movements are largely error-free, and you have a minimal level of cognitive monitoring. You're assessing the need for cognitive attention when mistakes are made, and this is where VOD review can be very helpful. You have also developed automatic movements, so your mechanical skills have become automatic. You focus on competitive aspects of skills as appropriate. One question that a lot of people have, is it worth my time to warm up? And just because you have achieved a high level of mechanical skill, that doesn't mean that your technique cannot slip. Warming up your aim is incredibly important to prime your nervous system for competitive tasks each day. The next big question we have to answer is what do we have available to us to train our aim? When training our aim, there are a variety of tools that we can use that range from third-party aim trainers, things like Kovacs and Aim Lab, in-game aim trainers, things like Creative Maps, and isolation scenarios, things like No Build Deathmatch. Utilizing in-game physics and mechanics will always be better training than using a third-party program. Utilizing more layers of complexity in something like a no-build deathmatch scenario where players move in realistic ways will give you the ultimate aim training experience as long as it is designed to challenge all degrees of freedom, that being vertical and horizontal and far and near. To break down the pros and cons of different aim training tools, let's first start with third-party apps. Like I said, these are things like Kovacs and Aim Lab. The pro for this is that it will challenge your aim in a variety of scenarios. There are hundreds and hundreds of protocols you can do that can train all different types of aim. Things that this aim trainer will not do is it does not have in-game physics. So whatever game you're trying to apply these skills that you're training in something like a third-party aim trainer will not be exactly like the physics in the game that you're training for. And the target movement is not going to be as realistic to the game that you're playing. For game-specific scenarios, these are things like creative aim maps. These are going to challenge your aim in a variety of scenarios, just like Kovacs will. They have native game physics, 
but the target movement is often not realistic. And that's where things like no build deathmatch comes into play. This is gonna challenge your aim in a variety of scenarios, will have native game physics, and targets will move realistically because they are other players, not AI. So now that we've talked about the scientific basis behind how humans learn and maintain motor skills, let's talk about what is the best duration for our practice scheduling next. When using aim trainers, scheduling your practice is gonna be the most critical part of maximizing your motor learning and performance. So first we're gonna talk about the types of practice and practice parameters, then we will be discussing where in the three stages of learning the different types of practice are most useful. The first practice schedule we're going to talk about is going to be the grind schedule, also known as mass practice. So the grind schedule is a sequence of practice and rest times in which the rest time is going to be much less than the practice time. For example, 45 minutes of aim training with a 15 minute break, followed by another 45 minutes of aim training, is a perfect example of the grind schedule. When is it ideal, you might ask? Well, the grind schedule should be considered when motivation and skill levels are high and when you have an adequate amount of endurance and attention, and it's best going to be used in the pro phase. Risks associated with the grind schedule include fatigue, decreased performance, as well as risk of injury that you have to consider when you're using the schedule. But overall, this is a highly efficient way for high-level performers to practice. The next practice schedule we want to talk about is the recovery schedule, also known as distributed practice. So the recovery schedule is a spaced practice interval in which the practice time is equal to or less than the rest time. For example, 15 minutes of aim training followed by a 45 minute break and then another 15 minutes of aim training will be the perfect example of the recovery schedule. So when exactly is this ideal? Well, distributed practice results in the most learning per training time, although the total training time is gonna be increased. And it's gonna be most useful in the noob phase. With adequate rest periods, performance can be improved without the interfering effects of fatigue or increasing safety issues, and is perfect for new players learning mechanics of a game to get a good handle on what's going on. So not only does your phase of learning and practice schedule make a difference, the order that you organize the tasks you need to practice matters. Different orderings are going to be useful within different stages of learning, and understanding when to utilize each will give you a more efficient training model. So the first strat we're going to talk about when organizing your practice scenarios is the repetition strat, also known as blocked order. Blocked order practice is the repeated practice of a task or groups of tasks in order. For example, three trials of task one, three trials of task two, and then three trials of task three. For a more specific example for aim training, Say you do three sets of five minutes of horizontal tracking, and then three sets of five minutes of vertical tracking, and then three sets of five minutes of dynamic click timing, and then three sets of five minutes of composite click timing, this would be an example of the repetition strat. This strat is going to be most useful for early acquisition of skills and is going to be most useful in the noob phase. Up next, we're talking about the sequence strat, also known as serial order. So the sequence strat is practice that is in a predictable and repeating order, and it's practicing multiple tasks in a sequential order. For example, one set of five minutes of horizontal tracking, followed by one set of five minutes of vertical tracking, followed by one set of five minutes of dynamic click timing, followed by one set of five minutes of composite click timing, with that whole set being repeated three times is gonna be a perfect example of your sequence strat. So when is this ideal? Well, the sequence and the random strat, which we're about to talk about next, produce better retention and generalizability of skills. This is due to a concept that is called contextual interference and increased depth of cognitive processing. Contextual interference is a concept that states, the more your brain has to shift gears while completing tasks, the harder they are to perform during the task, but you will be more likely to perform them well later. This strategy is most useful in the amateur phase. And finally, we're gonna be talking about the random strat, also known as random order. This random strat is a non-repeating and non-predictable order of multiple tasks. 
So for example, if you're going to do one set of five minutes of horizontal tracking and then vertical tracking and then dynamic click timing and then composite click timing and then go back to vertical tracking and then composite click timing and then dynamic click timing, that would be an example of a random strat. Not necessarily in that order as it is random. So when is this ideal? Well, random and sequential ordering of tasks may initially delay acquisition of the desired movements, but over the long term it will result in improved retention and generalizability. And this is going to be most useful in the associated and autonomous stage, also known as the amateur and the pro phase. In addition to the strategies and practice schedules that we just got done talking about, there are other strategies and principles that can be used at any point in the continuum to improve your transference of skills from practice scenarios to in-game success. For example, mental practice is a practice strategy in which performance of the motor task is imagined or visualized without any overt physical practice. This can be incorporated into your VOD reviewing. When you identify situations that you should have performed differently, actually take the time to mentally practice the skills you should have performed or modified for increased transference. Studies show that mental rehearsal of a motor task reinforces the cognitive component of motor learning. That is, learning what to do when performing a task and refining how it is executed. Mental practice has consistently been found to assist with the acquisition of motor skills, and when combined with physical practice, it has been shown to increase the accuracy and efficiency of movements at significantly faster rates than physical practice alone. All right, so this last concept I want to give you guys is this concept of part-whole practice. Part-whole practice is when you take the component parts of a task and you practice them before practicing the whole task. Neuromotor skills such as AIM are tasks that can be broken down into individual components. For example, vertical and horizontal aiming patterns are combined by the brain to allow you to aim in any direction. Thus, breaking down aim into vertical and horizontal components will help improve your ability to aim in any direction. So when is this ideal? Well, part-whole practice is most effective with things called discrete or serial motor tasks that have highly independent parts. Things like aiming, building, and editing are all great examples. So what are the cons? Well, part-whole practice is not as effective for things like continuous movement tasks or for complex tasks with highly integrated parts. Game sense dependent tasks, rotating, pressure aiming, target prioritization, etc., are all examples of highly integrated tasks that are very complex. So, for these tasks, practice of the integrated whole will result in superior learning. Scenarios such as zone wars, death matches, box fights, etc., are going to be the go to scenarios for practicing these complex tasks. To sum up everything that we've talked about today, We've created this table with every phase outlined and what needs to happen in each phase. If you would like to check out the article version of this video, make sure you check out the description below. So to review what happens in each phase, we're going to start with the noob phase. During this phase, you should be using a recovery schedule, a repetition strat order, and you should be using third party apps for both warm up and training. In the amateur phase, you're going to want to use the grind schedule, and you're going to want to use a sequential strat and a random strat when organizing your practice. For warm-up and training, you're going to want to use game-specific scenarios, things like creative aim maps. In the pro phase, you're also going to want to use the grind schedule, as well as utilizing random strats to organize your practice. For warm-up, you're going to want to use deathmatch, as well as game-specific scenarios, and for training, you're just going to want to use game-specific scenarios, things like creative aim maps. Thank you guys for watching the video. I'm going to hand it over to Matt. Oh, whoa. It's me again. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you guys learned just as much in the second part as you guys did the first part. If you guys want to check out the article, look at the link in the description. There's going to be two parts. Again, mine and Elliot's. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you guys learned a lot. Please share this with anyone you feel like might benefit from knowing a little more about aim training or aim coaching. And don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, turn on notifications, and check out our channel for more of this amazing content. See you guys soon.